Chapter One of the Red Hand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wanda White. The Red Hand by Arthur Machen. Chapter One. The Problem of the Fish Hooks. There can be no doubt whatever," said Mr. Phillips, "that my theory is the true one." these flints are prehistoric fish-hooks. I dare say. But you know that in all probability the things were forged the other day with a door-key. Stuff, said Phillips. I have some respect, Dyson, for your literary abilities, but your knowledge of ethnology is insignificant, or rather non-existent. These fish-hooks satisfy every test. They are perfectly genuine. Possibly. But as I said just now, you go to work at the wrong end. You neglect the opportunities that confront you and await you, obvious, at every corner. You positively shrink from the chance of encountering primitive man in this whirling and mysterious city, and you pass the weary hours in your agreeable retirement of Red Lion Square, fumbling with bits of flint, which are, as I said, in all probability, rank forgeries. Phillips took one of the little objects and held it up in exasperation. Look at that ridge, he said. Did you ever see such a ridge as that on a forgery? Dyson merely grunted and lit his pipe, and the two sat smoking in rich silence, watching through the open window the children in the square as they flitted to and fro in the twilight of the lamps, as elusive as bats flying on the verge of a dark wood. Well, said Phillips at last, it is really a long time since you have been round. I suppose you have been working at your old task? Yes, said Dyson always the chase of the phrase i shall grow old in the hunt but it is a great consolation to meditate on the fact that there are not a dozen people in england who know what style means i suppose not for the matter of that the study of ethnology is far from popular and the difficulties primitive man stands dim and very far off across the great bridge of years by the way he went on after a pause what was that stuff you were talking just now about shrinking from the chance of encountering primitive man at the corner or something of the kind there are certainly people about here whose ideas are very primitive i wish phillips you would not rationalize my remarks if i recollect the phrase correctly i hinted that you shrank from the chance of encountering primitive man in this whirling and mysterious city and i meant exactly what i said who can limit the age of survival the troglodyte and the lake-dweller perhaps representatives of yet darker races may very probably be lurking in our midst rubbing shoulders with frock-coated and finely draped humanity ravening like wolves at heart and boiling with the foul passions of the swamp and the black cave now and then as i walk in holborn or fleet street i see a face which i pronounce abhorred and yet i could not give a reason for the thrill of loathing that stirs within me my dear dyson i refuse to enter myself in your literary trying on department i know that survivals do exist but all things have a limit and your speculations are absurd you must catch me your troglodyte before i will believe in him i agree to that with all my heart said dyson chuckling at the ease with which he had succeeded in drawing phillips nothing could be better it's a fine night for a walk he added taking up his hat what nonsense you are talking dyson said phillips However, I have no objection to taking a walk with you. As you say, it is a pleasant night. Come along, then, said Dyson, grinning. But remember our bargain. The two men went out into the square, and threading one of the narrow passages that serve as exits, struck towards the northeast. As they passed along a flaring causeway, they could hear at intervals, between the clamor of the children and the triumphant Gloria played on a piano organ, the long deep hum and roll of the traffic in holborn a sound so persistent that it echoed like the turning of everlasting wheels dyson looked to right and left and conned the way and presently they were passing through a more peaceful quarter touching on deserted squares and silent streets black as midnight phillips had lost all count of direction and as by degrees the region of faded respectability gave place to the squalid and dirty stucco offended the eye of the artistic observer he merely ventured the remark that he had never seen a neighbourhood more unpleasant or more commonplace more mysterious you mean said dyson i warn you phillips we are now hot upon the scent 
they dived yet deeper into the maze of brickwork. Some time before, they had crossed a noisy thoroughfare running east and west, and now the quarter seemed all amorphous, without character. Here a decent house with sufficient garden, here a faded square, and here factories surrounded by high blank walls with blind passages and dark corners, but all ill-lighted and unfrequented and heavy with silence. Presently, as they paced down a forlorn street of two-story houses, Dyson caught sight of a dark and obscure turning. "'I like the look of that,' he said. "'It seems to me promising.' There was a street lamp at the entrance, and another, a mere glimmer, at the further end. Beneath the lamp on the pavement, an artist had evidently established his academy in the daytime, for the stones were all a blur of crude colors rubbed into each other, and a few broken fragments of chalk lay in a little heap beneath the wall. "'You see, people do occasionally pass this way,' said Dyson, pointing to the ruins of the screever's work. "'I confess I should not have thought it possible.' come let us explore on one side of this byway of communication was a great timber yard with vague piles of wood looming shapeless above the enclosing walls and on the other side of the road a wall still higher seemed to enclose a garden for there were shadows like trees and a faint murmur of rustling leaves broke the silence it was a moonless night and clouds that had gathered after sunset had blackened and midway between the feeble lamps the passage lay all dark and formless, and when one stopped and listened, and the sharp echo of reverberant footsteps ceased, there came from far away, as from beyond the hills, a faint roll of the noise of London. Phillips was bolstering up his courage to declare that he had had enough of the excursion, when a loud cry from Dyson broke in upon his thoughts. "'Stop! Stop, for heaven's sake, or you will tread on it! There! Almost under your feet!' Phillips looked down and saw a vague shape, dark and framed in surrounding darkness, dropped strangely on the pavement, and then a white cuff glimmered for a moment as Dyson lit a match, which went out directly. "'It's a drunken man,' said Phillips very coolly. "'It's a murdered man,' said Dyson, and he began to call for police with all his might, and soon from the distance running footsteps echoed and grew louder, and cries sounded. A policeman was the first to come up. "'What's the matter?' he said, as he drew to a stand, panting. "'Anything amiss here?' For he had not seen what was on the pavement. "'Look,' said Dyson, speaking out of the gloom. "'Look there! My friend and I came down this place three minutes ago, and that is what we found.' The man flashed his light on the dark shape and cried out. "'Why, it's murder!' he said. "'There's blood all about him, and a puddle of it in the gutter there. "'He's not dead long either.' "'Ah, there's the wound. It's in the neck.' Dyson bent over what was lying there. He saw a prosperous gentleman, dressed in smooth, well-cut clothes. The neat whiskers were beginning to grizzle a little. He might have been forty-five an hour before, and a handsome gold watch had half slipped out of his waistcoat pocket. And there, in the flesh of the neck, between chin and ear, gaped a great wound, clean-cut, but all clotted with drying blood and the white of the cheeks shone like a lighted lamp above the red. Dyson turned and looked curiously about him. The dead man lay across the path with his head inclined towards the wall, and the blood from the wound streamed away across the pavement, and lay a dark puddle, as the policeman had said, in the gutter. Two more policemen had come up. The crowd gathered, humming from all quarters, and the officers had as much as they could do to keep the curious at a distance. The three lanterns were flashing here and there, searching for more evidence, and in the gleam of one of them Dyson caught sight of an object in the road, to which he called the attention of the policeman nearest to him. "'Look, Phillips,' he said, when the man had secured it and held it up. "'Look! That should be something in your way!' It was a dark flinty stone, gleaming like obsidian, and shaped to a broad edge, something after the manner of an ad's. One end was rough and easily grasped in the hand, and the whole thing was hardly five inches long. The edge was thick with blood. "'What is that, Phillips?' said Dyson, and Phillips looked hard at it. "'It's a primitive flint knife,' he said. "'It was made about ten thousand years ago. One exactly like this was found near Abbery, in Wiltshire, and all the authorities gave it that age.' 
the policeman stared astonished at such a development of the case and phillips himself was all aghast at his own words but mr dyson did not notice him an inspector who had just come up and was listening to the outlines of the case was holding a lantern to the dead man's head dyson for his part was staring with a white heat of curiosity at something he saw on the wall just above where the man was lying there were a few rude marks done in red chalk this is a black business said the inspector at length does anybody know who it is a man stepped forward from the crowd i do governor he said he's a big doctor his name's sir thomas vivian i was in the hospital of art six months ago and he used to come round he was a very kind man lord cried the inspector this is a bad job indeed why sir thomas vivian goes to the royal family and there's a watch worth a hundred guineas in his pocket so it isn't robbery dyson and phillips gave their cards to the authority and moved off pushing with difficulty through the crowd that was still gathering gathering fast and the alley that had been lonely and desolate now swarmed with white staring faces and hummed with the buzz of rumour and horror and rang with the commands of the officers of police the two men once free from this swarming curiosity stepped out briskly but for twenty minutes neither spoke a word phillips said dyson as they came into a small but cheerful street clean and brightly lit phillips i owe you an apology i was wrong to have spoken as i did to-night such infernal jesting he went on with heat as if there were no wholesome subjects for a joke i feel as if i had raised an evil spirit for heaven's sake say nothing more said phillips choking down horror with visible effort you told the truth to me in my room the troglodyte as you said is still lurking about the earth and in these very streets around us slaying for mere lust of blood i will come up for a moment said dyson when they reached red lion square i have something to ask you i think there should be nothing hidden between us at all events phillips nodded gloomily and they went up to the room where everything hovered indistinct in the uncertain glimmer of the light from without when the candle was lighted and the two men sat facing each other dyson spoke perhaps he began you did not notice me peering at the wall just above the place where the head lay the light from the inspector's lantern was shining full on it and i saw something that looked queer to me and i examined it closely i found that some one had drawn in red chalk a rough outline of a hand a human hand upon the wall but it was the curious position of the fingers that struck me it was like this and he took a pencil and a piece of paper and drew rapidly and then handed what he had done to phillips it was a rough sketch of a hand seen from the back with the fingers clenched and the top of the thumb protruded between the first and second fingers and pointed downwards as if to something below it was just like that said dyson as he saw philip's face grow still whiter the thumb pointed down as if to the body it seemed almost a live hand in ghastly gesture and just beneath there was a small mark with the powder of the chalk lying on it as if some one had commenced a stroke and had broken the chalk in his hand i saw the bit of chalk lying on the ground but what do you make of it it's a horrible old sign said phillips one of the most horrible signs connected with the theory of the evil eye it is used still in italy but there can be no doubt that it has been known for ages it is one of the survivals you must look for the origin of it in the black swamp whence man first came dyson took up his hat to go i think jesting apart said he that i kept my promise and that we were and are hot on the scent as i said it seems as if i had really shown you primitive man or his handiwork at all events end of chapter one chapter two of the red hand by arthur machin this librivox recording is in the public domain incident of the letter about a month after the extraordinary and mysterious murder of sir thomas vivian the well-known and universally respected specialist in heart disease mr dyson called again on his friend mr phillips whom he found not as usual sunk deep in painful study but reclining in his easy chair in an attitude of relaxation he welcomed dyson with cordiality i am very glad you have come he began i was thinking of looking you up there is no longer the shadow of a doubt about the matter you mean the case of sir thomas vivian oh no not at all i was referring to the problem of the fish-hooks 
between ourselves i was a little too confident when you were here last but since then other facts have turned up and only yesterday i had a letter from a distinguished fellow of the royal society which quite settles the affair i have been thinking what i should tackle next and i am inclined to believe that there is a good deal to be done in the way of so-called undecipherable inscriptions your line of study pleases me said dyson i think it may prove useful but in the meantime there was surely something extremely mysterious about the case of sir thomas vivian hardly i think i allowed myself to be frightened that night but there can be no doubt that the facts are a patient of a comparatively commonplace explanation really what is your theory then well i imagine that vivian must have been mixed up at some period of his life in an adventure of a not very creditable description and that he was murdered out of revenge by some italian whom he had wronged why italian because of the hand the sign of the mano in fica that gesture is now only used by italians so you see that what appeared the most obscure feature in the case turns out to be illuminate yes quite so and the flint knife that is very simple the man found the thing in italy or possibly stole it from some museum follow the line of least resistance my dear fellow and you will see there is no need to bring up primitive man from his secular grave beneath the hills there is some justice in what you say said dyson as i understand you then you think that your italian having murdered vivian kindly chalked up that hand as a guide to scotland yard why not remember a murderer is always a madman he may plot and contrive nine-tenths of his scheme with the acuteness and the grasp of a chess-player or a pure mathematician but somewhere or other his wits leave him and he behaves like a fool then you must take into account the insane pride or vanity of the criminal he likes to leave his mark as it were upon his handiwork yes it is all very ingenious but have you read the reports of the inquest no not a word i simply gave my evidence left the court and dismissed the subject from my mind quite so then if you don't object i should like to give you an account of the case i have studied it rather deeply and i confess it interests me extremely very good but i warn you i have done with mystery we are to deal with facts now yes it is fact that i wish to put before you and this is fact the first when the police moved sir thomas vivian's body they found an open knife beneath him it was an ugly-looking thing such as sailors carry with a blade that the mere opening rendered rigid and there the blade was already bare and gleaming but without a trace of blood on it and the knife was found to be quite new it had never been used now at the first glance it looks as if your imaginary italian were just the man to have such a tool but consider a moment would he be likely to buy a new knife expressly to commit murder and secondly if he had such a knife why didn't he use it instead of that very odd flint instrument and i want to put this to you you think the murderer chalked up the hand after the murder as a sort of melodramatic italian assassin's mark touch passing over the question as to whether the real criminal ever does such a thing i would point out that on the medical evidence sir thomas vivian hadn't been dead for more than an hour that would place the stroke at about a quarter to ten and you know it was perfectly dark when we went out at nine thirty and that passage was singularly gloomy and ill-lighted and the hand was drawn roughly it is true but correctly and without the bungling of strokes and the bad shots that are inevitable when one tries to draw in the dark or with shut eyes just try to draw such a simple figure as a square without looking at the paper and then ask me to conceive that your italian with the rope waiting for his neck could draw the hand on the wall so firmly and truly in the black shadow of that alley it is absurd by consequence then the hand was drawn early in the evening long before any murder was committed or else mark this phillips it was drawn by some one to whom darkness and gloom were familiar and habitual by some one to whom the common dread of the rope was unknown again a curious note was found in sir thomas vivian's pocket envelope and paper were of a common make and the stamp bore the west central postmark i will come to the nature of the contents later on but it is the question of the handwriting that is so remarkable the address on the outside was neatly written in a small clear hand but the letter itself might have been written by a persian who had learnt the english script it was upright and the letters were curiously contorted 
with an affectation of dashes and backward curves which really reminded me of an oriental manuscript though it was all perfectly legible but and here comes the poser on searching the dead man's waistcoat pockets a small memorandum book was found it was almost filled with pencil jottings these memoranda related chiefly to matters of a private as distinct from a professional nature there were appointments to meet friends notes of theatrical first nights the address of a good hotel and tour and the title of a new novel nothing in any way intimate and the whole of these jottings were written in a hand nearly identical with the writing of the note found in the dead man's coat pocket there was just enough difference between them to enable the expert to swear that the two were not written by the same person i will just read you so much of lady vivian's evidence as bears on this point of the writing i have the printed slip with me here you see she says i was married to my late husband seven years ago i never saw any letter addressed to him in a hand at all resembling that on the envelope produced nor have i ever seen writing like that in the letter before me i never saw my late husband using the memorandum book but i am sure he did write everything in it i am certain of that because we stayed last may at the hotel du faisan rue royale tour the address of which is given in the book i remember his getting the novel a sentinel about six weeks ago sir thomas vivian never liked to miss the first nights at the theatres his usual hand was perfectly different from that used in the notebook and now last of all we come back to the note itself here it is in fact simile my possession of it is due to the kindness of inspector cleeve who is pleased to be amused at my amateur inquisitiveness read it phillips you tell me you are interested in obscure inscriptions here is something for you to decipher mr phillips absorbed in spite of himself in the strange circumstances dyson had related took the piece of paper and scrutinized it closely the handwriting was indeed bizarre in the extreme and as dyson had noted not unlike the persian character in its general effect but it was perfectly legible read it loud said dyson and phillips obeyed hand did not point in vain the meaning of the stars is no longer obscure strangely enough the black heaven vanished or was stolen yesterday but that does not matter in the least as i have a celestial globe our old orbit remains unchanged you have not forgotten the number of my sign or will you appoint some other house i have been on the other side of the moon and can bring something to show you and what do you make of that said dyson it seems to me mere gibberish said phillips you suppose it has a meaning oh surely it was posted three days before the murder it was found in the murdered man's pocket it is written in a fantastic hand which the murdered man himself used for his private memoranda there must be purpose under all this and to my mind there is something ugly enough hidden under the circumstances of this case of sir thomas vivian but what theory have you formed oh as to theories i am still in a very early stage it is too soon to state conclusions but i think i have demolished your italian i tell you phillips again the whole thing has an ugly look to my eyes i cannot do as you do and fortify myself with cast-iron propositions to the effect that this or that doesn't happen and never has happened you note that the first word in the letter is hand that seems to me taken with what we know about the hand on the wall significant enough and what you yourself told me of the history and meaning of the symbol its connection with a world-old belief and faiths of dim far-off years all this speaks of mischief for me at all events no i stand pretty well to what i said to you half in joke that night before we went out there are sacraments of evil as well as of good about us and we live and move to my belief in an unknown world a place where there are caves and shadows and dwellers in twilight it is possible that man may sometimes return on the track of evolution and it is my belief that an awful lore is not yet dead i cannot follow you in all this said phillips it seems to interest you strangely what do you propose to do my dear phillips replied dyson speaking in a lighter tone i am afraid i shall have to go down a little in the world i have a prospect of visits to the pawnbrokers before me and the publicans must not be neglected i must cultivate a taste for four ale shag tobacco i already love and esteem with all my heart 
End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Red Hand by Arthur Machen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Wanda White. Chapter Three Search for the Vanished Heaven. For many days after the discussion with Phillips, Mr. Dyson was resolute in the line of research he had marked out for himself. A fervent curiosity and an innate liking for the obscure were great incentives but especially in this case of Sir Thomas Vivian's death, for Dyson began to boggle a little at the word murder, there seemed to him an element that was more than curious. The sign of the red hand upon the wall, the tool of flint that had given death, the almost identity between the handwriting of the note and the fantastic script reserved religiously, as it appeared, by the doctor for trifling jottings, all these diverse and variegated threads joined to weave in his mind a strange and shadowy picture with ghastly shapes dominant and deadly and yet ill-defined like the giant figures wavering in an ancient tapestry he thought he had a clue to the meaning of the note and in his resolute search for the black heaven which had vanished he beat furiously about the alleys and obscure streets of central london making himself a familiar figure to the pawnbroker and a frequent guest at the more squalid pot-houses. For a long time he was unsuccessful, and he trembled at the thought that the black heaven might be hid in the coy retirements of Peckham, or lurk perchance in distant Willesden, but finally improbability, in which he put his trust, came to the rescue. It was a dark and rainy night, with something in the unquiet and stirring gusts that savoured of approaching winter, and Dyson, beating up a narrow street not far from the Gray's Inn Road, took shelter in an extremely dirty public, and called for beer, forgetting for the moment his preoccupations, and only thinking of the sweep of the wind about the tiles and the hissing of the rain through the black and troubled air. At the bar there gathered the usual company, the frowsy women and the men in shiny black, those who appeared to mumble secretly together, others who wrangled in interminable argument and a few shy drinkers who stood apart, each relishing his dose, and the rank and biting flavor of cheap spirit. Dyson was wondering at the enjoyment of it all, when suddenly there came a sharper accent. The folding doors swayed open, and a middle-aged woman staggered towards the bar, and clutched the pewter rim as if she stepped a deck in a roaring gale. Dyson glanced at her attentively, as a pleasing specimen of her class. She was decently dressed in black, and carried a black bag of somewhat rusty leather, and her intoxication was apparent and far advanced. As she swayed at the bar, it was evidently all she could do to stand upright, and the barman, who had looked at her with disfavor, shook his head in reply to her thick-voiced demand for a drink. The woman glared at him, transformed in a moment to a fury, with bloodshot eyes, and poured forth a torrent of execration, a stream of blasphemies and early English phraseology. "'Get out of this,' said the man. "'Shut up and be off, or I'll send for the police.' "'Police! You!' bawled the woman. "'I'll, well, give you something to fetch the police for!' and with a rapid dive into her bag she pulled out some object which she hurled furiously at the barman's head. The man ducked down, and the missile flew over his head and smashed a bottle to fragments, while the woman, with a peal of horrible laughter, rushed to the door, and they could hear her steps pattering fast over the wet stones. The barman looked ruefully about him. "'Not much good going after her,' he said and I'm afraid what she's left won't pay for that bottle of whiskey. He fumbled amongst the fragments of broken glass, and drew out something dark, a kind of square stone, it seemed, which he held up. Valuable curiosity, he said. Any gent like to bid? The habitués had scarcely turned from their pots and glasses during these exciting incidents. They gazed a moment, fishily, when the bottle smashed, and that was all, and the mumble of the confidential was resumed and the jangle of the quarrelsome, and the shy and solitary sucked in their lips and relished again the rank flavor of the spirit. Dyson looked quickly at what the barman held before him. "'Would you mind letting me see it?' he said. "'It's a queer-looking old thing, isn't it?' It was a small black tablet, apparently of stone, about four inches long by two and a half broad, and as Dyson took it, he felt rather than saw 
that he touched the secular with his flesh. There was some kind of carving on the surface, and, most conspicuous, a sign that made Dyson's heart leap. "'I don't mind taking it,' he said quietly. "'Would two shillings be enough?' "'Say half a dollar,' said the man, and the bargain was concluded. Dyson drained his pot of beer, finding it delicious, and lit his pipe, and went out deliberately soon after. When he reached his apartment he locked the door, and placed the tablet on his desk, and then fixed himself in his chair, as resolute as an army in its trenches before a beleaguered city. The tablet was full under the light of the shaded candle, and scrutinizing it closely, Dyson saw first the sign of the hand, with the thumb protruding between the fingers. It was cut finely and firmly on the dull black surface of the stone, and the thumb pointed downward to what was beneath. It is mere ornament, said Dyson to himself, perhaps symbolical ornament, but surely not an inscription, or the signs of any words ever spoken. The hand pointed at a series of fantastic figures, spirals and whirls of the finest, most delicate lines, spaced at intervals over the remaining surface of the tablet. The marks were as intricate and seemed almost as much without design as the pattern of a thumb impressed upon a pane of glass. Is it some natural marking? thought Dyson. There have been queer designs, likenesses of beasts and flowers in stones with which man's hand had nothing to do. And he bent over the stone with a magnifier, only to be convinced that no hazard of nature could have delineated these varied labyrinths of line. The whirls were of different sizes. Some were less than the twelfth of an inch in diameter, and the largest was a little smaller than a sixpence and under the glass the regularity and accuracy of the cutting were evident, and in the smaller spirals the lines were graduated at intervals of a hundredth of an inch. The whole thing had a marvelous and fantastic look, and gazing at the mystic whirls beneath the hand, Dyson became subdued with an impression of vast and far-off ages, and of a living being that had touched the stone with enigmas before the hills were formed, when the hard rocks still boiled with fervent heat. The black heaven is found again, he said, but the meaning of the stars is likely to be obscure for everlasting so far as I am concerned. London stilled without, and a chill breath came into the room as Dyson sat gazing at the tablet shining duskily under the candlelight, and at last, as he closed the desk over the ancient stone, all his wonder at the case of Sir Thomas Vivian increased tenfold, and he thought of the well-dressed, prosperous gentleman lying dead mystically beneath the sign of the hand, and the insupportable conviction seized him that between the death of this fashionable West End doctor and the weird spirals of the tablet there were most secret and unimaginable links. For days he sat before his desk gazing at the tablet, unable to resist its lodestone fascination, and yet quite helpless, without even the hope of solving the symbols so secretly inscribed. At last, desperate, he called in Mr. Phillips in consultation, and told in brief the story of the finding of the stone. "'Dear me,' said Phillips, "'this is extremely curious. You have had a find indeed. Why, it looks to me even more ancient than the Hittite seal. I confess, the character, if it is a character, is entirely strange to me. These worlds are really very quaint.' "'Yes, but I want to know what they mean.' You must remember this tablet is the black heaven of the letter found in Sir Thomas Vivian's pocket. It bears directly on his death. Oh, no, that is nonsense. This is no doubt an extremely ancient tablet, which has been stolen from some collection. Yes, the hand makes an odd coincidence, but only a coincidence after all. My dear Phillips, you are a living example of the truth of the axiom, that extreme skepticism is mere credulity but can you decipher the inscription? I undertake to decipher anything, said Phillips. I do not believe in the insoluble. These characters are curious, but I cannot fancy them to be inscrutable. Then take the thing away with you and make what you can of it. It has begun to haunt me. I feel as if I had gazed too long into the eyes of the Sphinx. Phillips departed with the tablet in an inner pocket. He had not much doubt of success, for he had evolved thirty-seven rules for the solution of inscriptions. Yet when a week had passed, and he called to see Dyson, there was no vestige of triumph on his features. He found his friend in a state of extreme irritation, pacing up and down in the room like a man in a passion. He turned with a start as the door opened. 
Well, said Dyson, have you got it? What is it all about? My dear fellow, I am sorry to say I have completely failed. I have tried every known device in vain. I have even been so officious as to submit it to a friend at the museum. But he, though a man of prime authority on the subject, tells me he is quite at fault. It must be some wreckage of a vanished race, almost, I think, a fragment of another world than ours. I am not a superstitious man, Dyson, and you know that I have no truck with even the noble delusions, but I confess I yearn to be rid of this small square of blackish stone. Frankly, it has given me an ill week. It seems to me troglodytic and abhorred. Phillips drew out the tablet and laid it on the desk before Dyson. By the way, he went on, I was right at all events in one particular. It has formed part of some collection. There is a piece of grimy paper on the back that must have been a label. Yes, I noticed that, said Dyson, who had fallen into deepest disappointment. No doubt the paper is a label, but as I don't much care where the tablet originally came from, and only wish to know what the inscription means, I paid no attention to the paper. The thing is a hopeless riddle, I suppose, and yet it must surely be of the greatest importance. Phillips left soon after, and Dyson, still despondent, took the tablet in his hand and carelessly turned it over. The label had so grimed that it seemed merely a dull stain, but as Dyson looked at it idly, and yet attentively, he could see pencil marks, and he bent over it eagerly with his glass to his eye. To his annoyance he found that part of the paper had been torn away, and he could only with difficulty make out odd words and pieces of words. First he read something that looked like, In Road, and then beneath, Stony Hearted Step, and a tear cut off the rest. But in an instant a solution suggested itself, and he chuckled with huge delight. Certainly, he said out loud, this is not only the most charming, but the most convenient quarter in all London. Here I am, allowing for the accidents of side streets, perched on a tower of observation. He glanced triumphant out of the window across the street to the gate of the British Museum. Sheltered by the boundary wall of that agreeable institution, a screever, or artist in chalks, displayed his brilliant impressions on the pavement, soliciting the approval, and the coppers, of the gay and serious. This, said Dyson, is more than delightful. An artist is provided to my hand. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Red Hand by Arthur Machen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Wanda White. Chapter 4 The Artist of the Pavement. Mr. Phillips, in spite of all disavowals, in spite of the wall of sense, of whose enclosure and limit he was wont to make his boast, yet felt in his heart profoundly curious as to the case of Sir Thomas Vivian. Though he kept a brave face for his friend, his reason could not decently resist the conclusion that Dyson had enunciated, namely, that the whole affair had a look both ugly and mysterious. There was the weapon of a vanished race that had pierced the great arteries, the red hand, the symbol of a hideous faith that pointed to the slain man, and then the tablet which Dyson declared he had expected to find, and had certainly found, bearing the ancient impress of the hand of malediction, and a legend written beneath in a character compared with which the most antique cuneiform was a thing of yesterday. Besides all this, there were other points that tortured and perplexed. How to account for the bare knife found unstained beneath the body? and the hint that the red hand upon the wall must have been drawn by someone whose life was passed in darkness thrilled him with a suggestion of dim and infinite horror. Hence he was in truth not a little curious as to what was to come, and some ten days after he had returned the tablet, he again visited the mystery man, as he privately named his friend. Arrived in the grave and airy chambers in Great Russell Street, he found the moral atmosphere of the place had been transformed. All Dyson's irritation had disappeared. His brow was smoothed with complacency, and he sat at a table by the window, gazing out into the street with an expression of grim enjoyment, a pile of books and papers lying unheeded before him. "'My dear Phillips, I am delighted to see you. Pray excuse my moving. Draw your chair up here to the table and try this admirable shag tobacco.' "'Thank you,' said Phillips. 
judging by the flavor of the smoke i should think it is a little strong but what on earth is all this what are you looking at i am on my watch-tower i assure you that the time seems short while i contemplate this agreeable street and the classic grace of the museum portico your capacity for nonsense is amazing replied phillips but have you succeeded in deciphering the tablet it interests me i have not paid much attention to the tablet recently said dyson i believe the spiral character may wait really and how about the vivian murder ah you do take an interest in that case well after all we cannot deny that it was a queer business but is not murder rather a coarse word it smacks a little surely of the police poster perhaps i am a trifle decadent but i cannot help believing in the splendid word sacrifice for example is surely far finer than murder i am all in the dark said phillips i cannot even imagine by what track you are moving in this labyrinth i think that before very long the whole matter will be a good deal clearer for us both but i doubt whether you will like hearing the story dyson lit his pipe afresh and leant back not relaxing however in his scrutiny of the street after a somewhat lengthy pause he startled phillips by a loud breath of relief as he rose from the chair by the window and began to pace the floor it's over for the day he said and after all one gets a little tired phillips looked with inquiry into the street the evening was darkening and the pile of the museum was beginning to loom indistinct before the lighting of the lamps but the pavements were thronged and busy the artist in chalks across the way was gathering together his materials and blurring all the brilliance of his designs and a little lower down there was the clang of shutters being placed in position phillips could see nothing to justify mr dyson's sudden abandonment of his attitude of surveillance and grew a little irritated by all these thorny enigmas do you know phillips said dyson as he strolled at ease up and down the room i will tell you how i work i go upon the theory of improbability the theory is unknown to you i will explain suppose i stand on the steps of st paul's and look out for a blind man lame of the left leg to pass me it is evidently highly improbable that i shall see such a person by waiting for an hour if i wait two hours the improbability is diminished but is still enormous and a watch of a whole day would give little expectation of success but suppose i take up the same position day after day and week after week don't you perceive that the improbability is lessening constantly growing smaller day after day don't you see that two lines which are not parallel are gradually approaching one another drawing nearer and nearer to a point of meeting till at last they do meet and improbability has vanished altogether that is how i found the black tablet i acted on the theory of improbability it is the only scientific principle i know of which can enable one to pick out an unknown man from amongst five million and you expect to find the interpreter of the black tablet by this method certainly and the murder of sir thomas vivian also yes i expect to lay my hands on the person concerned in the death of sir thomas vivian in exactly the same way the rest of the evening after phillips had left was devoted by dyson to sauntering in the streets and afterwards when the night grew late to his literary labors or the chase of the phrase as he called it the next morning the station by the window was again resumed his meals were brought to him at the table and he ate with his eyes on the street with briefest intervals snatched reluctantly from time to time he persisted in his survey throughout the day and only at dusk when the shutters were put up and the screever ruthlessly deleted all his labor of the day just before the gas lamps began to star the shadows did he feel at liberty to quit his post day after day this ceaseless glance upon the street continued till the landlady grew puzzled and aghast at such a profitless pertinacity but at last one evening when the play of lights and shadows was scarce beginning and the clear cloudless air left all distinct and shining there came the moment a man of middle age bearded and bowed with a touch of grey about the ears was strolling slowly along the northern pavement of great russell street from the eastern end he looked up at the museum as he went by and then glanced involuntarily at the art of the screever and at the artist himself who sat beside his pictures hat in hand the man with the beard stood still an instant swaying slightly to and fro as if in thought and dyson saw his fist shut tight and his back quivering and the one side of his face in view twitched and grew contorted with the indescribable torment of approaching epilepsy 
Dyson drew a soft hat from his pocket and dashed to the door open, taking the stair with a run. When he reached the street, the person he had seen so agitated had turned about and, regardless of observation, was racing wildly towards Bloomsbury Square with his back to his former course. Mr. Dyson went up to the artist of the pavement and gave him some money, observing quietly, You needn't trouble to draw that thing again. Then he, too, turned about and strolled idly down the street in the opposite direction to that taken by the fugitive, so the distance between Dyson and the man with the bowed head grew steadily greater. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Red Hand by Arthur Machen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Wanda White. Chapter Five Story of the Treasure House. There are many reasons why I chose your rooms for the meeting in preference to my own, chiefly, perhaps, because I thought the man would be more at his ease on neutral ground. I confess, Dyson, said Phillips, that I feel both impatient and uneasy. You know my standpoint, hard matter of fact, materialism, if you like, in its crudest form. But there is something about all this affair of Vivian that makes me a little restless. And how did you induce the man to come? He has an exaggerated opinion of my powers. You remember what I said about the doctrine of improbability? When it does work out, it gives results which seem very amazing to a person who is not in the secret. That is eight-striking, isn't it? And there goes the bell. They heard footsteps on the stair, and presently the door opened, and a middle-aged man with a bowed head, bearded, and with a good deal of grizzling hair about his ears, came into the room. Phillips glanced at his features, and recognized the lineaments of terror. "'Come in, Mr. Selby,' said Dyson. "'This is Mr. Phillips, my intimate friend and our host for this evening. Will you take anything? Then perhaps we had better hear your story. A very singular one, I am sure.' The man spoke in a voice hollow and a little quavering, and a fixed stare that never left his eyes seemed directed to something awful that was to remain before him by day and night for the rest of his life. "'You will, I am sure, excuse preliminaries,' he began. "'What I have to tell is best told quickly. I will say, then, that I was born in a remote part of the west of England, where the very outlines of the woods and hills, and the winding of the streams in the valleys, are apt to suggest the mystical to any one strongly gifted with imagination. When I was quite a boy there were certain huge and rounded hills, certain depths of hanging wood, and secret valleys bastioned round on every side that filled me with fancies beyond the bourne of rational expression, and as I grew older and began to dip into my father's books I went by instinct, like the bee, to all that would nourish fantasy. Thus, from a course of obsolete and occult reading, and from listening to certain wild legends in which the older people still secretly believed, I grew firmly convinced of the existence of treasure, the hoard of a race extinct for ages, still hidden beneath the hills, and my every thought was directed to the discovery of the golden heaps that lay, as I fancied, within a few feet of the green turf. To one spot in especial I was drawn as if by enchantment. It was a tumulus, the domed memorial of some forgotten people, crowning the crest of a vast mountain range. And I have often lingered there on summer evenings, sitting on the great block of limestone at the summit, and looking out far over the yellow sea towards the Devonshire coast. One day, as I dug heedlessly with the ferrule of my stick, at the mosses and lichens which grew rank over the stone, my eye was caught by what seemed a pattern beneath the growth of green. There was a curving line, and marks that did not look altogether the work of nature. At first I thought I had bared some rarer fossil and I took out my knife and scraped away at the moss till a square foot was uncovered. Then I saw two signs which startled me. First a closed hand, pointing downwards, the thumb protruding between the fingers, and beneath the hand a whirl or spiral, traced with exquisite accuracy in the hard surface of the rock. Here, I persuaded myself, was an index to the great secret, but I chilled at the recollection of the fact that some antiquarians had tunneled the tumulus through and through, and had been a good deal surprised at not finding so much as an arrowhead within. Clearly, then, the signs on the limestone had no local significance, and I made up my mind that I must search abroad. By sheer accident I was in a measure successful in my quest. Strolling by a cottage, I saw some children playing by the roadside, 
one was holding up some object in his hand and the rest were going through one of the many forms of elaborate pretense which make up a great part of the mystery of a child's life something in the object held by the little boy attracted me and i asked him to let me see it the plaything of these children consisted of an oblong tablet of black stone and on it was inscribed the hand pointing downwards just as i had seen it on the rock while beneath spaced over the tablet were a number of whirls and spirals cut as it seemed to me with the utmost care and nicety i bought the toy for a couple of shillings the woman of the house told me it had been lying about for years she thought her husband had found it one day in the brook which ran in front of the cottage it was a very hot summer and the stream was almost dry and he saw it amongst the stones that day i tracked the brook to a well of water gushing up cold and clear at the head of a lonely glen in the mountain that was twenty years ago and i only succeeded in deciphering the mysterious inscription last august i must not trouble you with irrelevant details of my life it is enough for me to say that i was forced like many another man to leave my old home and come to london of money i had very little and i was glad to find a cheap room in a squalid street off the gray's inn road the late sir thomas vivian then far poorer and more wretched than myself had a garret in the same house and before many months we became intimate friends and i had confided to him the object of my life i had at first great difficulty in persuading him that i was not giving my days and my nights to an inquiry altogether hopeless and chimerical but when he was convinced he grew keener than myself and glowed at the thought of the riches which were to be the prize of some ingenuity and patience i liked the man intensely and pitied his case he had a strong desire to enter the medical profession but he lacked the means to pay the smallest fees and indeed he was not once or twice but often reduced to the very verge of starvation i freely and solemnly promised that under whatever chances he should share in my heaped fortune when it came and this promise to one who had always been poor and yet thirsted for wealth and pleasure in a manner unknown to me was the strongest incentive he threw himself into the task with eager interest and applied a very acute intellect and unwearied patience to the solution of the characters on the tablet i like other ingenious young men was curious in the matter of handwriting and i had invented or adapted a fantastic script which i used occasionally and which took vivian so strongly that he was at the pains to imitate it it was arranged between us that if we were ever parted and had occasion to write on the affair that was so close to our hearts this queer hand of my invention was to be used and we also contrived a semi-cipher for the same purpose meanwhile we exhausted ourselves in efforts to get at the heart of the mystery and after a couple of years had gone by i could see that vivian began to sicken a little of the adventure and one night he told me with some emotion that he feared both our lives were being passed away in idle and hopeless endeavour not many months afterwards he was so happy as to receive a considerable legacy from an aged and distant relative whose very existence had been almost forgotten by him and with money at the bank he became at once a stranger to me he had passed his preliminary examination many years before and he forthwith decided to enter at st thomas's hospital and he told me that he must look out for a more convenient lodging as we said good-bye i reminded him of the promise i had given and solemnly renewed it but vivian laughed with something between pity and contempt in his voice and expression as he thanked me i need not dwell on the long struggle and misery of my existence now doubly lonely i never wearied or despaired of final success and every day saw me at work the tablet before me and only at dusk would i go out and take my daily walk along oxford street which attracted me i think by the noise and motion and glitter of the lamps this walk grew with me to a habit every night and in all weathers i crossed the gray's inn road and struck westward sometimes choosing a northern track by the euston road and tottenham court road sometimes i went by holborn and sometimes by way of great russell street every night i walked for an hour to and fro on the northern pavement of oxford street and the tale of de quincey and his name for the street stony-hearted stepmother often recurred to my memory then i would return to my grimy den and spend hours more in endless analysis of the riddle before me the answer came to me one night a few weeks ago it flashed into my brain in a moment and i read the inscription and saw that after all i had not wasted my days the place of the treasure house of them that dwell below were the first words i read and then followed minute indications of the spot in my own country where the great works of gold were to be kept for ever such a track was to be followed such a pitfall avoided 
Here the way narrowed almost to a fox's hole, and there it broadened, and so at last the chamber would be reached. I determined to lose no time in verifying my discovery, not that I doubted at that great moment, but I would not risk even the smallest chance of disappointing my old friend Vivian, now a rich and prosperous man. I took the train for the west, and one night, with chart in hand, traced out the passage of the hills, and went so far that I saw the gleam of gold before me. I would not go on. I resolved that Vivian must be with me, and I only brought away a strange knife of flint which lay on the path, as confirmation of what I had to tell. I returned to London, and was a good deal vexed to find the stone tablet had disappeared from my rooms. My landlady, an inveterate drunkard, denied all knowledge of the fact, but I have little doubt she had stolen the thing for the sake of the glass of whisky it might fetch. However, I knew what was written on the tablet by heart, and I had also made an exact facsimile of the characters, so the loss was not severe. Only one thing annoyed me. When I first came into possession of the stone, I had pasted a piece of paper on the back and had written down the date and place of finding, and later on I had scribbled a word or two, a trivial sentiment, the name of my street, and such like idle pencilings on the paper, and these memories of days that had seemed so hopeless were dear to me. I had thought they would help to remind me in the future of the hours when I had hoped against despair. However, I wrote at once to Sir Thomas Vivian, using the handwriting I have mentioned, and also the quasi-cipher. I told him of my success, and after mentioning the loss of the tablet and the fact that I had a copy of the inscription, I reminded him once more of my promise, and asked him either to write or call. He replied that he would see me in a certain obscure passage in Clerkenwell, well known to us both in the old days, and at seven o'clock one evening I went to meet him. At the corner of this byway, as I was walking to and fro, I noticed the blurred pictures of some street artist, and I picked up a piece of chalk he had left behind him, not much thinking what I was doing. I paced up and down the passage, wondering a good deal, as you may imagine, as to what manner of man I was to meet after so many years of parting, and the thoughts of the buried time coming thick upon me, I walked mechanically without raising my eyes from the ground. I was startled out of my reverie by an angry voice, and a rough inquiry why I didn't keep to the right side of the pavement, and looking up I found I had confronted a prosperous and important gentleman who eyed my poor appearance with a look of great dislike and contempt. I knew directly it was my old comrade, and when I recalled myself to him, he apologized with some show of regret, and began to thank me for my kindness, doubtfully, as if he hesitated to commit himself, and, as I could see, with the hint of a suspicion as to my sanity. I would have engaged him at first in reminiscences of our friendship, but I found Sir Thomas viewed those days with a good deal of distaste, and replying politely to my remarks, continually edged in business matters, as he called them. I changed my topics, and told him in greater detail what I have told you. Then I saw his manner suddenly change, as I pulled out the flint knife to prove my journey, to the other side of the moon, as we called it in our jargon. There came over him a kind of choking eagerness. His features were somewhat discomposed, and I thought I detected a shuddering horror, a clenched resolution, and the effort to keep quiet succeed one another in a manner that puzzled me. I had occasion to be a little precise in my particulars, and it being still light enough, I remembered the red chalk in my pocket, and drew the hand on the wall. Here you see is the hand, I said, as I explained its true meaning. Note where the thumb issues from between the first and second fingers. And I would have gone on, and had applied the chalk to the wall to continue my diagram, when he struck my hand down, much to my surprise. No, no, he said, I do not want all that, and this place is not retired enough. Let us walk on, and do you explain everything to me minutely. I complied readily enough, and he led me away, choosing the most unfrequented byways, while I drove in the plan of the hidden house word by word. Once or twice, as I raised my eyes, I caught Vivian looking strangely about him. He seemed to give a quick glint up and down, and glance at the houses, and there was a furtive and anxious air about him that displeased me. "'Let us walk on to the north,' he said at length. "'We shall come to some pleasant lanes where we can discuss these matters quietly.' my night's rest is at your service i declined on the pretext that i could not dispense with my visit to oxford street and went on till he understood every turning and winding and the minutest detail as well as myself we had returned on our footsteps and stood again in the dark passage just where i had drawn the red hand on the wall for i recognized the vague shape of the trees whose branches hung above us 
"'We have come back to our starting point,' I said. "'I almost think I could put my finger on the wall where I drew the hand, "'and I am sure you could put your finger on the mystic hand in the hills as well as I. "'Remember, between stream and stone.' I was bending down, peering at what I thought must be my drawing, when I heard a sharp hiss of breath, and started up, and saw Vivian, with his arm uplifted, and a bare blade in his hand, and death threatening in his eyes. In sheer self-defense I caught at the flint weapon in my pocket, and dashed at him in blind fear of my life, and the next instant he lay dead upon the stones. "'I think that is all,' Mr. Selby continued after a pause. And it only remains for me to say to you, Mr. Dyson, that I cannot conceive what means enabled you to run me down. I followed many indications, said Dyson, and I am bound to disclaim all credit for acuteness, as I have made several gross blunders. Your celestial cipher did not, I confess, give me much trouble. I saw at once that terms of astronomy were substituted for common words and phrases. You had lost something black, or something black had been stolen from you, a celestial globe is a copy of the heavens, so I knew you meant you had a copy of what you had lost. Obviously, then, I came to the conclusion that you had lost a black object with characters or symbols written or inscribed on it, since the object in question certainly contained valuable information, and all information must be written or pictured. Our old orbit remains unchanged, evidently our old course or arrangement. The number of my sign must mean the number of my house, the allusion being to the signs of the zodiac. I need not say that the other side of the moon can stand for nothing but some place where no one else has been, and some other house is some other place of meeting, the house being the old term house of the heavens. Then my next step was to find the black heaven that had been stolen, and by a process of exhaustion I did so. You have got the tablet? Certainly and on the back of it, on the slip of paper you have mentioned, I read Inn Road, which puzzled me a good deal, till I thought of Gray's Inn Road. You forgot the second inn. Stony-hearted Step immediately suggested the phrase of De Quincey you have alluded to, and I made the wild but correct shot that you were a man who lived in or near the Gray's Inn Road, and had the habit of walking in Oxford Street, for you remember how the opium-eater dwells on his wearying promenades along that thoroughfare? On the theory of improbability, which I have explained to my friend here, I concluded that occasionally, at all events, you would choose the way by Guilford Street, Russell Square, and Great Russell Street, and I knew that if I watched long enough, I should see you. But how was I to recognize my man? I noticed the screever opposite my rooms, and got him to draw every day a large hand, in the gesture so familiar to us all, upon the wall behind him. I thought that when the unknown person did pass, he would certainly betray some emotion at the sudden vision of the sign, to him the most terrible of symbols. You know the rest. Ah, as to catching you an hour later, that was, I confess, a refinement. From the fact of your having occupied the same rooms for so many years, in a neighborhood, moreover, where lodgers are migratory to excess, I drew the conclusion that you were a man of fixed habit and i was sure that after you had got over your fright you would return for the walk down oxford street you did by way of new oxford street and i was waiting at the corner your conclusions are admirable said mr selby i may tell you that i had my stroll down oxford street the night sir thomas vivian died and i think that is all i have to say scarcely said dyson how about the treasure i had rather we did not speak of that said mr selby with a whitening of the skin about the temples "'Oh, nonsense, sir! We are not blackmailers. Besides, you know you are in our power.' "'Then, as you put it like that, Mr. Dyson, I must tell you I returned to the place. I went on a little farther than before. The man stopped short, his mouth began to twitch, his lips moved apart, and he drew in quick breaths, sobbing. "'Well, well,' said Dyson, "'I dare say you have done comfortably.' "'Comfortably?' Selby went on, constraining himself with an effort. Yes, so comfortably that hell burns hot within me forever. I only brought one thing away from that awful house within the hills. It was lying just beyond the spot where I found the flint knife. Why did you not bring more? The whole bodily frame of the wretched man visibly shrank and wasted. His face grew yellow as tallow, and the sweat dropped from his brows. The spectacle was both revolting and terrible, and when the voice came— it sounded like the hissing of a snake. 
because the keepers are still there and i saw them and because of this and he pulled out a small piece of curious gold work and held it up there he said that is the pain of the goat phillips and dyson cried out together in horror at the revolting obscenity of the thing put it away man hide it for heaven's sake hide it i brought that with me that is all he said you do not wonder that i did not stay long in a place where those who live are a little higher than the beasts and where what you have seen is surpassed a thousandfold take this said dyson i brought it with me in case it might be useful and he drew out the black tablet and handed it to the shaking horrible man and now said dyson will you go out the two friends sat silent a little while facing one another with restless eyes and lips that quivered i wish to say that i believe him said phillips my dear phillips said dyson as he threw the windows wide open i do not know that after all my blunders in this queer case were so very absurd end of chapter five end of the red hand by arthur mockin